Welcome to Gemara Academy. In this class, we'll present an overview of the Gemara with the Teisvis on the Sefta Shabbos, Tafhei Amr Aleph, and Tafhei Amr Beis. Let's see the general outline of this class. In the Gemara, we presented three teachings from Rabbi Yechanan regarding the Akira and Anacha, and there are five Teisvis on this piece of Gemara. So let's see the, the flowcharts. So here we have the flowchart, three flowcharts of each of the teachings of Rabbi Yechanan. We have the first one, the second, and the third. And there are a total of five tasteless. The first tasteless is on the first flowchart. The next four tasteless are on the second flowchart. And there are no tasteless on the last flowchart. So let's begin and see the tasteless. So the first tasteless is on the Gemara explaining the question of Rabbi Yechanan. Rabbi Yechanan asked, What's the din if somebody threw an item four amas in Rosh Hashanah and he ran and caught the item four amas distant from where he threw it? The question is, is he chayv or not? The Gemara asks, what's the question? Of course he's chayv. He did an akira. He made it go four amas in Rishas Arabim, and he did an anacha. He should certainly be chayv. So if Adab or Abba explained that the question is, shnei kaychas ba'adam. If there are two forces in one person, how do we look at it? And the simple way of understanding it is, do we say that since it's two separate and distinct forces, therefore they become separated, and there's just an akira with one force, and just an anacha with another force, and therefore the person is putter, just like if two people would have done it in that manner, they would be putter? What do we say? We look at it as one person, since ultimately he did the Akira, he made it go four Amas and Rishasarabim, and he did the Anacha, therefore he's in a Bichayev. So here Taisus presents that there are actually two ways of understanding the case. The case itself of the person throwing the item four Amas and Rishasarabim, there are two ways of understanding the case, and based on that, there are two ways of understanding the two sides of the question. We just mentioned one of the ways, because that was the simple, straightforward way. Taisus presents an alternative understanding of the case as well as an alternative understanding of the two sides of the question, which is from Rabbeinu Hanano. And now we'll move on to the next four Teisvis, which are all on the second flowchart. And the first Teisvis is on, on the Mishnah that we presented that said that if an individual was sitting on a Carmelis and he was holding a Sefer and part of it rolled into the Rosh Hashanah, the Mishnah ruled that the, indivi- the person is permitted, it's mutter for him to roll back the Sefer. So Teisvis explains why it specifically talks about a Sefer if a person may bring back any item. When you look at the Mishnah, it says if a person was reading a Sefer, which would seem to indicate only a Sefer is allowed to be brought back, but not any other item. The truth is a person can bring back anything. So the question is, why does the Mishnah specifically speak about a Sefer? And Teisvis explains the reason. So we see... We see that Teisvis is coming to support and explain the Gemara. It's a Sefer, he tells us the reason for it. The next Teisvis is on the next piece of Gemara, where, which goes on the next case in the Mishnah. The next case of the Mishnah was that if an individual was sitting on the roof, which is Rosh Hashanah, and the Sefer rolled off, and it came into the Rosh Hashanah within 10 Tfachim of the ground, he's not allowed to bring it back. As the Gemara asked, why can't he bring it back? Although it entered the Rosh Hashanah, it did not come to rest in the Rosh Hashanah. So Rava explained it did come to rest, since it was referring to a sloping wall. The house was a slope, had a sloping wall, and the Sefer came to rest within ten Tfachim of the ground, making it a Rosh Hashanah, and on the sloping wall, so it came to rest. Mm-hmm. So Tesis explains how the wall can be considered a Rosh Hashanah. Generally, like we explained, a sloping wall will be considered a Mokim Ptur, or a Carmelis. So Tesis explains how it could be a Rosh Hashanah. Once again, the goal of Tesis, the purpose of Tesis, is to support what the Gemara is saying. The Gemara is telling us that when it comes to rest on the wall, it's considered at rest in the Rosh Hashanah. Tesis explains how it could be considered a Rosh Hashanah. The next Tesis is on the teaching that we presented of Rava, as well as the following question. The teaching of Rava was that is al gabi mayim lav that a nut that's on water is not considered at rest. And then Rava asked the question. What's the din of a nut that's in a container that's resting, floating on water? Is that considered at rest? So Tesis over here explains that the criteria for what's considered at rest on Shabbos is different than by Kenyan and elsewhere. And it's based on if a person would place something in such a manner. Tesis basically explains that by Shabbos what's considered at rest is not based on some general principle that applies everywhere. Rather it's distinct and specific to Shabbos. And therefore we'll find that what's not considered to be at rest by Shabbos, which the example here is a nut on water will be considered to be at rest by Kinyan. And furthermore, Tesis explains that the criteria for Shabbos is whether it's something that a person would do. Would a person place something in such a manner? If he would, then it will be considered at rest. And as a result, the, what's considered at rest of Shabbos is different than what might be considered at rest elsewhere. And furthermore, even in Shabbos itself, we'll find distinctions between very similar cases because the focus and the question will always be would a person do such a thing? So if a person would not do 
a specific type of action to put something, place something aside to be at rest somewhere, but he would do something very similar, then one case will say is not at rest, and the other one will say is at rest. So the point over here is Tais is explaining to us, we're discussing that a, a nut is not considered to be at rest at water, but we have a question whether if it's placed on a container that's floating on water, whether then it's considered to be at rest. Tais explains to us that the background and the understanding behind all of this is the question we need to ask, would a person place something in such a manner when he wants to set something aside? And the last and final Tesfus is on the Mishnah that we presented with the Machlekes between the Rabbanon and Rabbi Yechanan ben Nuri. If there was oil in a cup and wine beneath it, so there was wine in a cup, on top of it there was oil, and they were truma, and a Tvul Yem touched the oil. We presented the Machlekes. The Rabbanon said only the oil is puzzle because we look at the oil and wine as separate. And Rabbi Yechim ben Nuri said the oil and the wine are puzzle since we look at them as one entity sitting in the cup. So Taisus over here proves that oil is considered a mashka. He proves this because if oil is not a mashka, we wouldn't specifically talk about a tvul yim. We would have discussed any sheni l'tuma. The reason why we would specifically talk about a tvul yim and not any sheni l'tuma is because oil is considered a mashka. And what we understand as a result is that this explains why the case refers to a tvul yim and not just any sheni l'tuma. So here in this taisvis, Taisvis tells us how what we learned, what it teaches us elsewhere, it teaches us a general idea that oil is considered a liquid, it's considered a mashka regarding tuma, and then there's something that we get to understand as a result as well in our Gemara itself, which is when we look at the Mishnah, one might wonder why does it specifically speak about a tvul yaim, which is one of the examples of a sheni l'tuma, why didn't we talk about just every sheni l'tuma, or any sheni l'tuma? So that becomes clear to us through this Taisvis. So we see how once again, Taisvis is coming to show us how what we learned, what it teaches us elsewhere, it's directly related to Argamara, as well as the understanding of what we actually learned.